This lecture is on the approach to undifferentiated chest pain. As with other chief complaints, the first step in any approach is figuring out what the chief complaint is and then building a critical differential from that chief complaint. The critical differential for chest pain includes the six chest pain pillars, esophageal rupture, tamponade, tension pneumothorax, aortic dissection, PE, and acute coronary syndrome. Some people add pneumonia to this differential, but that will not be discussed here. Most of the time the approach boils down to could this be ACS, PE, or aortic dissection. That's because we can use our history, exam, and vitals to break down and eliminate half the differential. For example, tamponade and tension pneumothorax are both obstructive shock states. So if the patient is not hypotensive, it's unlikely that somebody has tension or tamponade physiology. Understanding that everything is a spectrum Right, And so if a patient has a pericardial effusion without hypotension at the time, it doesn't mean that they can't later develop obstructive shock and tamponade. It just means that if your patient is not currently hypotensive, it's unlikely that at that snapshot in time, the patient has obstructive shock and therefore tamponade if they have a pericardial effusion. Again, both of these are obstructive shock states. Similarly, in esophageal rupture, this is a specific clinical syndrome where somebody had recent instrumentation such as an EGD or has had preceding retching and vomiting episodes before they developed a chest pain that may eventually turn into mediastinitis. Now that you cut your differential in half, you can focus on ACS, PE, and aortic dissection. To determine the likelihood of aortic dissection, you must focus on three things. Does the patient have aortic pain, meaning ripping or tearing pain that radiates to the back? Is the mediastinum widened on chest x-ray, meaning is it greater than eight centimeters? And lastly, are the pulses symmetric? If you don't have aortic type pain, the mediastinum is normal on chest x-ray. If the pulses are symmetric throughout and an alternative diagnosis is more likely, you've effectively ruled out aortic dissection. On the flip side, if your patient mentions one of the three things we listed, or if they're critically, critically ill without a clear diagnosis, uh, you may want to think about aortic dissection as a possible uh, ideology for the chest pain. The next disease process in our differential is pulmonary embolism. In patients under 50 years of age, we use the PERT criteria or the pulmonary embol embolism rule-out criteria. You can use the PERT criteria in low-risk patients for which you, um, the diagnosis of P is suspected but unlikely. And we can definitively rule out PE using vitals, history, and exam. In patients that are older than 50 years of age, we use the Wells or Geneva scoring systems, with the Wells score being the most commonly used. These scoring systems help give you a risk profile for your patient with chest pain, and in conjunction with a D-dimer will help guide whether or not a CT angio of the chest is necessary to rule out PE. In patients that are low to low intermediate risk uh, for PE by the scoring system, uh, if their D-dimer is negative, you've effectively ruled out PE. Patients that are high risk by Wells score or Geneva score uh, should go directly to CT angio of the chest. And uh, the utility of D-dimer in these patients is um, limited um, and should go directly to the definitive gold standard test to ruling out PE. Now that you've ruled out all but one of the disease processes in your differential, you want to take a step back and pause 
ask yourself one question. Is there anything else going on? This is where you go back to your patient's room and see if there's anything you may have missed. Uh, maybe there's a zoster rash that you didn't notice initially on the chest and that's why there's chest pain or um, maybe you can determine if there's a clear cut MSK component to the pain. If you can't convince yourself that there's anything else going on, then you have to go down and put your patient on the ACS pathway. Acute coronary syndrome is divided into two main categories, ST elevation ACS and non-ST elevation ACS. Non-ST elevation ACS is further subdivided into anstemi and unstable angina. What we are trying to get at is understanding what's going on at the level of the coronary artery. However, outside of a cath or an angiogram, we don't really have a way to look at what's going on at the coronary artery. The tools at our disposal are surrogates that help us understand what may be going on at the level of the coronary artery. Um, and therefore we rely on these three things to help us make clinical decisions moving forward. The first one is the patient's history, past medical history, chest pain story for this current chest pain event. The second is EKG, which we learned from our EKG lecture that the morphology of the ST segment and the T wave change over time when there's a coronary artery occlusion. And the last thing is troponin. In the emergency room, we rely on these three items to help us diagnose acute coronary syndrome. To diagnose a STEMI or ST elevation ACS, you only need one thing. That is a positive EKG, meaning ST elevations on the EKG. You don't need a troponin in this scenario to help you diagnose. As far as you're concerned, if the EKG has ST elevations, this is a STEMI until proven otherwise. We use the history and the clinical picture to help guide us because as you will learn more and become more sophisticated in your approach to acute coronary syndrome, you will find that not all ST elevations are STEMIs, but for now, consider any ST elevation as STEMI until proven otherwise. The diagnosis of NSTEMI requires two things. You have a negative EKG, meaning anything but ST elevations on the EKG. You can have a normal EKG to T wave inversions to ST depressions, each of which is more concerning than the previous, but you can't have any ST elevations because if you have ST elevations, it basically means you have ST elevation ACS. The second item you need is a positive troponin, typically greater than 0.3. This also gets a little nuanced and you'll hear people talk about different types of NSTEMI. Uh, for ACS, that is a type one NSTEMI. Uh, the other one you're more commonly deal with is a type two NSTEMI from quote unquote demand ischemia or quote unquote trope leak. Uh, but don't worry about that nuance at this time. Diagnosing STEMIs and NSTEMIs is relatively easy the harder part is figuring out if our patient has unstable angina because diagnosing unstable angina requires you to have a negative EKG and a negative troponin. So that means that we can only rely on history to make the diagnosis. And this is why diagnosing unstable angina is so difficult. EKGs and troponins are objective sensitive tests to determine if there is a coronary artery occlusion. Uh, however, obtaining history from a patient can be very variable. Some patients can be linear and very detailed in their storytelling, whereas others can sound like asking a drunk friend to explain a weird dream. Or you may have the scenario where there's a language barrier and you don't feel comfortable with the data you've obtained and the history you obtained.
the classical definition of unstable angina is categorized as chest pain that presents with one or more of the following. Chest pain that occurs at rest or with minimal exertion and that usually lasts more than 20 minutes. New onset of severe chest pain, or chest pain that occurs with a crescendo pattern, uh, you know, chest pain that was previously brought on by activity, but now less activity is bringing that same chest pain on, or the pain is now more severe with less activity or more prolonged with the previous activity that you were doing, um, or having more increased frequency in your chest pain. And that's a very strict definition that a lot of patients don't present with with acute coronary syndrome. So I tend to focus my HPI on determining if there are clinical factors that are increase the likelihood of ACS, or what we call, does the patient have a good chest pain story? Meaning, does the patient have chest pain that radiates to both arms, right arm or left arm? Does the patient have chest pain that is associated with exertion or associated with nausea and vomiting or diaphoresis? And then I double back to see if the patient has any anginal equivalence or if this is a patient that's at risk of presenting with atypical chest pain. So we're looking at women or elderly patients who may not present with chest pain. They might have shortness of breath be their anginal equivalent. Uh, people that are diabetic, people that have end-stage renal disease or immunocompromised, you know, they may, instead of presenting with chest pain, report symptoms like fatigue or weakness diaphoresis only, indigestion, nausea, vomiting, um, all these uh, which we coin anginal equivalents. Um, and I tend to think of anginal equivalents in patients that are over 50 years of age. So to give you an example, if you have somebody who's over 50 coming in with isolated nausea, vomiting, and some indigestion, and you don't have a clear abdominal or um, neurologic cause for this nausea vomiting uh, and you have a clear uh, abdominal cause for the indigestion you have to consider could this be an anginal equivalent and you have to screen this person for acute coronary syndrome using an EKG and a troponin but we don't want to get carried away with these anginal equivalents that doesn't mean that I routinely get EKGs on troponins on 25 year olds who have isolated nausea vomiting that's not abdominal or, or neurologic. Again, we have to think about this in the right patient population, and I typically start thinking about anginal equivalents uh, when patients are over 50, um, maybe a little younger if they have a lot of comorbidities that can put somebody at risk for accelerated uh, coronary artery disease. Since obtaining a history can be very subjective at times, we had to develop a validated scoring system to help us determine the patient's risk for unstable angina. That scoring system is the heart score. The heart score is a prospectively validated uh, clinical decision tool that tells you a patient's risk for major adverse cardiac event at six weeks. And a MACE, or major adverse cardiac event, is defined as an all-cause mortality, myocardial infarction, or coronary revascularization. We use the heart score in patients that are stable, so please do not use this on a patient with ST segment elevations that require emergent revascularization, or in patients that are unstable. This tool allows us to objectively risk stratify patients into low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk for unstable angina. And it also provides us with a disposition decision for our patients. Patients that are low risk uh, can be safely discharged home and have a stress test scheduled within 72 hours of discharge. Whereas patients that are intermediate risk by heart score need to be seen by a cardiologist prior to being discharged and are usually placed in cards observation units <clears throat> and patients that are considered high risk by heart score basically are saying that they have unstable angina and should be admitted to cardiology and treated like unstable angina and that is how we utilize the heart score another common question is how many ekgs and troponins do we need to definitively make a decision on a patient 
This is a hotly debated topic, but the most likely correct answer is that it depends. It really depends on how long the chest pain has been going on. Typically, we say if the chest pain episode started less than three hours ago, you should get two sets of EKGs and troponins. Whereas if the chest pain episode started more than three hours ago, you can rule the patient out uh, with one EKG and troponin. This is because most modern troponin assays can now detect troponin elevations as early as three to four hours after onset of myocardial injury. Although there are some people who get two sets of EKGs and troponins on everybody to complete the ACS rule out. And just remember, when you're saying that the patient has been ruled out for ACS, all you're saying is that they don't have a STEMI and that they don't have an end STEMI. You have not determined uh, with just EKGs and troponins if the patient has unstable angina. For you to be able to determine the patient's risk for unstable angina, you have to calculate a heart score. And while that was a little long-winded, that is it. Uh, this was my attempt to give you a basic outline of all the cognitive processing that occurs when a patient presents to the ER with undifferentiated chest pain. Hope you enjoyed it.